Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I think you have to figure out what it is that you do and what you bring to things. And I think that there's a goofy element that I like to bring to things. Oh, hi. Didn't see you there. Oh, didn't hear you there. Just to like, just to spice, just to really give the uh, the illusion that I am having a dialogue with with you, listener. Oh, hello, very Fred Rogers, very Mr. Rogers neighborhood. Hello, neighbor, friend. Uh, welcome. <laughs> just going crazy in lockdown. Welcome to another episode of In the Envelope, the Actors Podcast from Backstage. I am your host Jack Smart, and. Um, to say we have a show for you today would be would be putting it mildly without, you know, overselling it. Uh, this interview we we had very recently with Maya Rudolph, six-time Emmy nominee Maya Rudolph, was such a treat and such a joy. And really, just more than that, I mean, it just got kind of at the heart of, of what I consider this podcast to be best at, which is getting at the heart of an artist's why and how and what, like, you know, who an artist is and how they are in the world and how they are creative. And Maya Rudolph needed no prompting to get there. And the other thing I just really love in these interviews is just asking people about their inspirations. And then when it's an answer you don't expect, but that makes perfect sense, um, an influence that you hadn't thought, you as a fan hadn't thought of, but the the guest then reveals, I grew up watching this and consuming this and thinking about this dynamic in my family or in my femininity. In my Rudolph's case, there's some there's some really fascinating stuff here that you would both never have thought of. I mean, I, I researched these guests heavily and I knew a lot about my Rudolph going into this. I'm a huge fan and I'm still so surprised by these by these influences that were nevertheless such a part of her of her as an artist. For those who may not know, she's a musician, she's a comedian on SNL for several years, not a stand-up comedian, as she says, but um, someone who's really known for creating characters, be they real people or imaginary people. Uh, We get some very specific voiceover character building advice here because she is the star of Big Mouth, among other things. Um, She's Emmy nominated for that and also for her amazing work on The Good Place as the judge, if you've seen The Good Place, and also on Saturday Night Live. Uh, We talked a lot about SNL and her work there, particularly recently, as Senator Kamala Harris. Now, the thing about this interview, as you will hear, is that through a very strange total fluke, total fluke of luck, um, this interview was scheduled a mere hour, like an actual hour after the announcement that um, Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden had selected Kamala Harris to be his vice presidential running mate. So we got to ask Maya Rudolph about that right away and for her thoughts on Kamala, which was really lovely. We actually wrote it up on Backstage.com. Um, looking over at Backstage.com, I know I've said this before, but the amount of content that we have with Emmy nominees this year is nuts. I'm looking at the list of cover, just looking at cover stars, Emmy nominees that we spoke to about their current you know, Emmy eligible season. Anna Kendrick, Eddie Murphy, Kerry Washington, Jerry, Jeremy Pope. This week we had Jeremy Strong, which was such an excellent cover. He's such a star of HBO Succession. Um, but we've also had Issa Rae, Christina Applegate, Rami Youssef. Um, do head over to check out all of the cover stories on Backstage.com. They all feature beautiful uh, original photography. And wouldn't you believe all of the recent ones were done in quarantine? <laughs> 
<laughs> you wouldn't believe it by looking at them. The Anna Kendrick ones in particular, I gotta say, those, those photos are stunning. Anyway, the best is yet to come. So speaking of the best, let's take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor and then get to today's lovely interview with Maya Rudolph. This episode is brought to you by HBO's Succession, one of this television season's most epic dramas. Created by Jesse Armstrong, Succession follows the Roy family as their aging father begins to step back from one of the biggest media conglomerates in the world. IndieWire hailed the show's second season as, quote, the best show on TV. Now nominated for 18 Emmy Awards, including Outstanding Drama Series. Maya Rudolph is a comedy, music, and acting legend working on her childhood dream job of Saturday Night Live for eight years and stealing the show in films Away We Go, Bridesmaids, Wine Country, and more, producing and starring on the variety show Maya and Marty with Martin Short and Forever with Fred Armisen, and lending her innate musicality to countless animation roles. She's currently Emmy Award nominated three times for her voiceover work on Netflix's Big Mouth and her guest appearance on NBC's The Good Place and Saturday Night Live, where she's returned to play vice presidential candidate Senator Kamala Harris. Here is Maya Rudolph. Thank you, Maya. I know it's a big day. Welcome to Backstage's podcast. I'm so I was so excited to talk to you before a couple of hours ago when we got a certain piece of news that is very newsworthy at the moment. Um, what are your thoughts on the nomination of Kamala Harris to the? Boy, movie? isn't it nice to get good news sometimes? I feel like I, I feel like um, I'm not my body and and my soul and my mind are not used to um, hope oh. lately. Oh, and completely. It feels really nice to know that someone so um, capable, fantastic, strong, and um, exciting is running for vice president. I feel like I forgot what this feels like. I forgot that it feels really good to feel hope. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I feel like there's a unanimous sort of feeling of joy I f it feels like yeah. and, and then on top of it because i played her it feels like my birthday everyone's my phone's <laughs> blowing up <laughs> i imagine yeah you were in the middle of doing press when you like found out yeah i felt like i was taking so long it was like for a long time everyone was saying oh it's gonna be in the next couple of weeks and it's been a couple of weeks and <laughs> just like everything else that's been happening in the world i kind of thought like eh why, why get hopes up anymore? Oh, what are hopes like and dreams? Um, I know. And um, I'm just so impressed with her to begin with. And I always have been from the beginning. Um, and it feels like a cheat to just be like associated with somebody fantastic. So I'll, <laughs> I'll take it. You know, sure. I didn't do any of the hard work, um, but it's really, it's really exciting. It feels like, yeah. oh my God, today might be a great day. Yeah, that's really well said about the hope. It was a, a feeling I wasn't necessarily in touch with before. before it's been this. a while, right? It's <laughs> like a, it feels like like um, like a baby baby horse learning to walk, but we'll get there. Totally, <laughs> totally. Um, is there like a weird thing where, because she was a part of the possibility of becoming a Veep, like there's something about playing characters on Saturday Night Live in particular. The results of an election or like the outcome of, of an election affects your job prospects. What was it like thinking about the possibility of her getting nominated so that you can then play her more? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, that would, that would be ideal. Sure. But um, I, I can't help but think like everyone else in this country about how much we need her um, and someone like her in office. Um, sure. And I, you know, so over the years playing, all kinds of different people um, in the political world on Saturday Night Live. You know, you you want nothing more than to play one of the the, the big players. Mm -hmm. And um, I got close when I was there, but no cigar. I um, right. I got to play Obama once. Yeah. Um, but it was it was when he was running. It was before he was president, and um, and it was in front of him, which is a personal. Um, <laughs> 
joy <laughs> memory, yeah. but it was not a great impression. So I'm glad that America <laughs> didn't see it. But you always want to be in that um, spot with the, you know, the current administration. You, you know, that that's such a, a joy to be um, part of that particular show and totally. what and what's going on in in that in that like main current of current events um and honestly like you know if it were whatever story that's going on um right. in the news i'd be happy to re- return to saturday night live i i i love it it really is my first love and um now my family you know my over the years it's become my family so i get such a joy knowing that I'll, you know, when I return and the times that I got to play um, Senator Harris were just such sweet experiences because of that, because it's a place that I love and um, with people that I love and in a place that makes me feel just a, like I, like I'm plugging right back into sort of like a, a a joy. Yeah. And it's such a one of a kind thing. Congratulations on your Emmy nomination, by the way, for for that and for two other projects, three in the same year. Crazy. So crazy. Um, Because we're backstage, I don't know how familiar you are with backstage. Did you ever use backstage? I did, and I did back in the day. I'm I'm an old lady. (laughs) I'm gonna gonna rub my screen so that it's clean with the bottom. Was this in LA? Like, what was your trajectory? What was Yeah, I grew up in LA and I, uh, I'd always wanted to be an actress. It was pretty, pretty boring. Sure. And um, I remember uh, knowing about the Groundlings Theater and getting to see shows there when I was in junior high. And I did theater, you know, throughout just throughout school, nothing professionally, just throughout school growing mm-hmm. up and musical theater and all kinds of plays and stuff and stuff in the summer. and But nothing professional. But I thought, you know, when I, when I grow up, I want to be an actor. But I thought it would be really boring to just Say that. finish high school and then just start acting. So I went to college and tried yes. to be a real person first. And you studied photography. Yeah, I was just f- around. I mean, <laughs> okay. I love it. I am a visual yeah. Oh, yeah. person and I love visual arts and I, I do make art that's not just acting. I like to draw and paint and right. take pictures of my feet, as they say. Um, but I, uh, but I knew that I thought that I wanted to, you know, to do go directly into acting and specifically so comedy and, and, yeah. um, so it was just kind of like four years to just kind of like become a, a young adult really, I think. Yeah. So there was never a moment of getting bit by the bug because your parents were both in the industry or in the, in the industry, but in a different way, but yeah. sort of in that same, it's funny. I, I you know, I tend to have this conversation a lot. My parents are musicians and I feel like I, I love this self-declared theory that musicians and comedians are kind of separated at birth. Um, And I always felt that way. And I still feel that way. Um, It's funny. I found some early footage of my mom on tour when we were kids and she was, and, and in those days, sometimes musicians would tour with um, comedians as opening acts. And her right. opening act was the Smothers Brothers. And they were, there was like footage of the Smothers, one of one of the Smothers Brothers um, teaching my brother how to yo-yo. Oh my gosh, and, um, that's so great. And it makes a lot of sense. There's something yeah. really similar in the DNA of musical people and comedians and i can't say that i know the exact answer or the recipe or or what makes it that way but Mm -hmm. um there seems to be some sort of inherent value of timing and the musicality of oh yeah of them both and they also love each other you know i've heard many gifted musicians say i wish i were funny or i wish it could be funny or they you know, constantly quote spinal tap mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And vice versa, I think any comedian would love to be a rock star and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, and I don't know why it that bug bit me in that way. I can't really say why, but I know that the performer element of it was alive and well in me at a pre- pretty early age. I mean, I... yeah. 
I was a kid performing for my parents in the living room, like a, like a, like maybe even of no course. pants on kid. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. So it definitely, it was acting and it was specifically comedy. It sounds like. Yeah. Mm. But I think there, I think to be perfectly honest, I think that I've always had a drag element somehow this sort of like grandiose mm. oh. a lady that's performing, you know, there's that. something about like a woman on stage. That's always really appealed to me. It's probably yes. watching my mom on stage Absolutely. singing in all these beautiful dresses and flowers in her hair and being adored from a stage, you know, probably really totally. got something cemented in me and she had command of the microphone. She was yeah. in charge and people were watching her. And yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I was there, I was witnessing that in utero and, you know, yeah. two and three. And yeah, cool. um, I think it had a really dramatic effect on me for sure. I like, I like that attention. It's uh, yes, it does come down to attention, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. I'm a Leo. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're a Leo. Um, I can see that kind of grandiose diva thing in like your Dion Warwick, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I love that stuff. And I, I totally. you know, there's something about a real, a real lady um, and a real yeah. lady performer that really appeals to me. My mom was obsessed with uh, Mae West Yeah. Okay. Um, when she was younger. And I think some, mm. some of that somehow seeped into me too and then you know my parents loved Mel Brooks movies and we used to mm. watch all that stuff and so all those Madeline Kahn characters oh, yeah. you know her in high anxiety when she's wearing that Louis Vuitton suit coming out of a Louis Vuitton Cadillac <laughs> like <laughs> I love I just yeah there's something about that that um the combination of how fabulous a woman can be yes. And at the same time, funny is like yeah. really the sweet spot to me. I really awesome. should have been born at a different time, but what are you going to do? I, <laughs> sure. I'm definitely, yeah, I'm, yeah, I should have been around in like in New York in the seventies and like sung in bathhouses and stuff. I miss right. that chance. That era of like, everyone has a different energy for a different era almost. Yeah. I think so. I mean, it's definitely where like my energy was, born and you yeah. know that's that thing that i relate to it's like you know my parents were pretty young in the 70s and um uh-huh. young and hip and and yeah and that stuff is was a it was, a, it was an exciting time oh sure yeah it's so it's always so cool to hear about um different inspirations that any artist has especially when they're really disparate things like it's so interesting you mentioned drag because now that you say that i'm like Absolutely, Mae West and and these grand these grand traditions of these divas, many of which you've played, yeah. is a realm of like campy, costumey charactery that ob- that very much makes sense in, in like the context of someone like you who then then goes on to play them on SNL or whatever. Yeah, it's it's the the, the more I age, the more I see it uh, right there. The writing was always on the wall. I just mm. don't think I really noticed it, but there's. Um, there's something very attractive to me about the world of women and becoming, mm. you know, and being, being a, a, a real woman, you know, so growing cool. up with, with my, my dad and my brother in the house. And I was the only girl for many years, you know, yeah. so it was like, like almost, I almost felt like a scientist researching what it was like to be a girl. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and I think I really like, you know, picked, Terry picked all these different kinds of ideas um, yeah. into like what the ideal woman is. And it's funny. It's like, you know, you don't even realize you already are one when you're <laughs> trying to become that. But oh, wow. those yeah. diva elements are definitely like a very exciting thing to me. And I think in a lot of ways it really, you know, it, 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 it it's come to my own attention that it really is an element of drag for me and, and yeah. uh, in a, in the best way possible, um, really, just to be able to sort of own being a woman and um, and not just a woman, but something really fabulous and yeah, really elevated. Really elevated. Yeah, it's a great word for it. So, um, yeah, like and that. it's fun because because I think that energy is so different than my own personal energy, oh. but it's really my my hmm. spirit animal. It's the yeah. it's the it's why Beyonce is so amazing on stage. She's shy, but then she's got that thing inside of her that's 
got to perform. Yeah. And then when she does, you're like, oh, there is there is a God. Thank there you. There is a God. She's right there. Being alive. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, it is that sort of like you you can escape into a character or even it's therapeutic, right? To become these people. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I think it's probably the thing that's gotten me through life. Um, yeah. I love, I love mm. to pretend <laughs> to be other people. And I love to, um, you know, I think Saturday Night Live was always the best, uh, my favorite job in the sense that like, you're wearing an armor, you know, you get to, you get to protect yourself. I mean, I, I think uh-huh. for many years, people assumed that I did stand up because I'm a comedian, but I've never done stand up. It's right. such a naked, vulnerable thing that I can't mm. fathom doing. Oh, wow. um, but my version of it comes with a suit of armor and allows me mm. to protect my little, my, my little sensitive inside. Artistic. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. So, so what kind of gigs was, uh, were you going out for in backstage? I, I mean, I don't know if I ever truly went out for anything. I think I was too scared, but oh, okay. it was like the Holy Grail, you know, you knew it was there and you knew that like, that's what professionals did. You know, okay. I mean, I wasn't really terribly adventurous, um, back mm-hmm. in the day. And, and, and when I came back from college, I remember telling my dad I wanted to be on Saturday Night Live, and he said, "That's great. What are you going to do to make a living?" Well, uh, okay. I do that. You know, he really was just being kind of uh, realistic for me yeah. about that. So, yeah. in those days, I was studying at the Groundlings Theater out here in LA, and I was um, a costume assistant, and I was assisting friends that were okay. working on commercials and music videos, and still auditioning for commercials and yeah. TV shows and stuff like that just I mean I had a pager and everything oh my what yeah. other um we love hearing about the survival gigs like the early career struggles like what else the pagers you... or you had to have like the <laughs> you had to pull on over and return a call on a yeah on a real uh payphone yeah <laughs> costume, yeah, did the costume I mean, assistant job is that in the industry enough that you were feeling like you was, were involved yeah and actually really did fulfill a creative need I have to say because I do I do I'm polyamorous to the arts in terms of like you know I don't just love performing I also again this goes back to why Saturday Night Live is such a great job for me you know when you're writing a piece and it gets chosen for the show you're not Mm -hmm. just writing the piece you're also deciding what it looks like you're producing it you know you totally you decide you talk to to hair and makeup about what the wigs look like you talk to costumes about what the costumes look like like which was truly one of my favorite elements of it um Tom Broker was the costume designer when I was there and and still is. And he's one of my, one of the most talented people I've ever worked with of all time. And um, he's just the reason why so much of the show um, works uh, because it's not just about clothing. It's about what makes sense and what's funny and having a sense of humor um, that's tasteful and works and so all that stuff was really fun to do. And I did and I did love having um, a chance to be creative with costumes. Plus it also like really has made me a much, um, I think, easier actor to deal with because I know what it's like to fit actors. Oh my um, God, yeah. Yeah, they can, uh, they can be assholes. <laughs> yes, which yeah. we don't mind hearing about. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's like anything. It's like when I worked as a waitress, you know, it's, it's yes. important to be, uh, to work in the service industry so that yeah. you understand what it's like to be, to wait on a table and not just be waited on. And I mean, it's the same thing. And I think I've worked in so many different versions of projects where there's a, a, a big budget and a small budget where I've, Oh, sure. an executive producer where I've just been a hired actor and you see all the elements of how things work together and how departments come together and, um, and how important it is to hire people that um, you want to work with and you want to show up as on yeah. set. I remember when we were working on Bridesmaids, I was so excited mm-hmm. um, to be working with a group of people that I actually, a lot of them I knew already. And mm-hmm. I remember thinking about making a very conscious choice about making um the person that i 
wanted to see walk into the sure. hair and makeup trailer every morning. You know, I, yeah. I remember feeling that feeling for so many years that there would be someone and they'd walk in and you'd feel like, ah, oh, what a, yeah. you know, what a nice start to my day. And I, and I remember telling myself, you can be that person gotcha. that is a joy to be around and um, is the person you look forward to seeing in the morning. And because yeah. it's a long day and oh, yeah. it's about, you know, the time you put into it, the time you spend and how you act around people. And it, and that's why it can be exhausting. It's not just like, oh, woe is me. I had to act all day. You know, you're also <laughs> being a human being in the world and surrounding sure. yourself with other people and um, trying to be um, conscientious and yeah. eating food that is mass produced and that can make you tired and cranky and oh, all the sure. things that go into a day where you're just like, yes. I'm trying so hard to have a good day because... I need my energy and I want my work to be good. And I also, I think it also helped that I was um, a a mom at that point, because I think um, part of the equation for me was that if I was going to leave these beautiful babies at home, it better be a damn good reason. It better be worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And that really changed, that changed a lot for me and it changed um, the choices of jobs that I've taken ever since. It's so it's so hard for me to justify working on something if it doesn't feel good, yeah. um, which is a luxury to have. Don't get me wrong. I'm well, sure. well aware that we all need to feed our families. But if I have a choice, I'd rather be happy at work um, yeah. than leave my kids. So the onset environment and definitely like the, your collaborators, who your collaborators are, those are maybe the biggest factors in deciding. Yeah, life is too short. I, it's yeah. honestly, it is too short. And, you know, and you have those experiences, especially in the early days when you can't get, you don't get to choose yes. who you spend your time with. And so totally. for me, it was um, knowing that you were going to be able to choose who you're with all day. That's why a couple of years ago, my friend Fred Armisen and I decided to do a show together because we mm-hmm. wanted to work together every day yeah. and yeah. we wanted to be able to it's have reason yeah just yeah. to be with people you love and admire and respect and who make you feel like you're better at your job love just that. by being around them yeah and that's actually just it's just great advice for any early career artist is don't be an asshole first of all and like yeah, don't be an asshole man i mean it does affect the work if you're an it's asshole. funny i you know i think i think there's definitely because there's, there is so much to the ego and there's so much Mm. involved in putting yourself out there and being vulnerable. And it's such a scary place. Um, when you're You're acting, when you're acting, I think, um, there seems to be some sort of like, you know, hidden memo that says like, when you don't know what you're doing, be a dick. And it's sort of like, (sighs) no, you don't really, you don't have to do that. But I think it takes a while for people Mm. to learn that it definitely, um, Kindness, kindness makes your day go a lot better. <laughs> a lot. Like that sign behind you that says, be kind, be kind, be kind. Yes. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah. There's my little reminder right there. Cause it's just true that like, it affects your day. It's all about what kind of day you're going to have. And if your default is to be a dick, it's not, it's not going to help your day or anyone's day. No, but it definitely, you know, feeds some sort of insecurity. I mean, look, I'm. It must. I'm older now than when I first started. So I thought, oh, they're an asshole. They must know what they're doing. And really, in reality, it's sort of like they're really insecure and right. they're scared. And that must be the reason behind maybe a default being when I don't know what's going on or where I am or what's what I'm supposed to do next. I'm going to act like a little bit more of an authority or a little bit more of a sure. diva than... <laughs> yeah, and it happens to all of us. I mean, yeah. there's absolutely no shortage of mistakes that I've made. But, um, but I think just like anything, it's really hard to admit that you need help or you don't understand something, but when you do, it can really open up a lot more of an opportunity to really Mm. connect with people or to get it, or just to say, I'm really sorry, but I don't understand or whatever that may be. My daughter just brought me food. I feel very lucky. (laughs) Just working at home stuff is is real. This episode is brought to you by HBO's critically acclaimed hit, Watchmen. Set in an alternate history where masked vigilantes are treated as outlaws, 
Damon Lindelof's adaptation embraces the nostalgia of the original graphic novel of the same name, while breaking entirely new ground of its own. NPR calls the limited series, quote, a masterpiece. Currently nominated for 26 Emmy Awards, including Outstanding Limited Series, consider Watchmen. Can I ask you about your SNL audition? Because as with most people, and we've, we've talked to Seth Meyers, we talked recently with A.D. Bryant, everyone always has like the SNL audition in the course of their career. That's probably, would you, would you say it's the most pivotal like moment in the career? It is, which is why mine really sucks because I did an audition. I had a really bizarre oh. experience. Oh, okay. So I was poised to position. I came, I had my flight and everything ready to go. Huh. Um, I was, some producers from the show, Steve Higgins among them, um, came to the Groundlings and afterwards they took me out for a hot dog at Pink's Hot Dogs and said, we'd love for you to come on audition this summer. I was like, the dream words you want to hear. Yeah. And, and so I got my audition ready. I got some characters together and some song parodies and all this stuff. And I had a manager at the time. I mean, I was, God, how old was I? Maybe 25, 26, uh-huh. 26, 20 ish. I was pretty young and impressionable. And um, hmm. I had a manager at the time that said, the contracts are new this year. Don't go. You know, if you if you go and you sign these new contracts, they're really binding and they're terrible. And I just don't want to see you do that. And she really seemed to know what she was talking about. So I listened to her and I didn't go. To the and I was, yeah. And I was um I was heartbroken, really heartbroken. Yeah. You know, this was someone who knew the show better than me. She yeah. was a talent scout for many years for the show, so she really knew what she was talking about. So I thought and I just, I listened and I, I think deep down I was probably too scared to say, well, screw you. I'm still going. So I, I listened right. and I knew in my gut, it just was the wrong choice. Um, yeah. And then I continued on at the groundlings. And by that time I got a job on a television show, um, a hospital drama called city of angels, but I was still doing yes. the groundlings and um, Steve Higgins thankfully came back and he said, we still, we're, we're still interested in you coming to okay. the show. I thought you're kidding. Okay, great. So I sent them a tape and then um, I got really lucky in that um, Lauren had me come out to, uh, to interview with him. And then um, I ended up instead of auditioning what I think happened, cause it was never really said was they put me on the last three episodes of the season. So I was, oh, wow. um, I was, uh, what do you call it? The, not, not the not ready for primetime players, but a featured, a featured player. Yeah. Um, I can't believe that I couldn't remember that for the last three shows of the 25th season. Right. Um, right. And I thank everything that that happened because that was, that's way more in my wheelhouse that I can do. And I can do that stuff in my sleep. I love the live element that I yeah. knew. I, I think I'm terrible at auditions and I don't know if I would have okay. gotten the job. Interesting. So interview and then the audition itself was sort of the being on the show for three episodes. Yeah, for three weeks. And then um, and then I waited all summer just biting my nails, but they had me back. It I've was heard. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But I, um, you know, I, I went to New York. I didn't know anybody. I was living in a hotel and you get to the show and <laughs> you go to the pitch meeting and then they say, okay, well, it's a writing night. And I thought, well, what do you do? And I remember Chris Parnell was there. Who mm-hmm. was, I knew from the Groundlings already. And he said, well, we write. And I said, till when? And he said, you know, five, six, seven in the morning. Ugh, yeah. It was pretty crazy. It really is boot camp. It, it's, I mean, mm-hmm. Julia Louis-Dreyfus said on this podcast that she really didn't enjoy her time there. <laughs> so. Yeah, and everybody's time there has been so different, you know? I yeah. mean, that's, it, that speaks volumes to me that someone that immensely talented right. and that fantastic who I admire so much had a very different experience. It really depends on mm-hmm. the environment and the environment, you know, ebbs and flows there. It, it depends sure. on, it depends on the time. It depends on the year. It depends on the people. It depends on the world outside of the show and the content that's being created for it. And I think, I think all of it, all of it. Yeah. Like you're saying that onset environment is super, super important in the process. 
yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we both know how insanely talented she is and, <laughs> and it sucks to hear that. I remember when she came and hosted and we all had a really good time with her. And I feel like I remembered hearing that from her, that it wasn't exactly the same experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and listen, no dream job is perfect. I definitely That's had my hear. fair share of times yes. where I thought like, oh, I can't do this anymore. Okay. But I did. <laughs> yes. Yeah, totally. Um, there are there are skills specific to SNL that I would love to get into like the craft. Let's talk about specifically Senator Harris. Mm-hmm. Like, how does an impression work? How much of it is based on the studying of the real person? Do you think of, for example, her as a character? Is it your... I yeah, I, I'm not an impressionist. I've never been an yeah. impressionist, but... I think when you, I know that when you start working at a show like Saturday Night Live, you have no choice but to, you know, hone your impression skills. And, um, you know, and and really it becomes an asset to you, the performer, because Mm. the moment you get a chance to play somebody, the more fun you can have and figure that out. And I've always come to impressions um, from the angle of creating characters. I don't. I don't really have an interest in, in skewering people out mm. in the world or like making anything of them. And I don't always, you know, when I worked at the show, sometimes you're assigned a person to do an impression of. And sometimes there's someone that you already do an impression of because you're a huge fan, you know. Um, cool. Fred Ar- Armisen and I talked about that recently because we talked about the Prince show and we talked about how he was a lifelong Prince fan and I was a Beyonce fan and it was easy to do impressions that you're already doing in, in your, your mirror, you know, in That's your back so cool. your mirror kind of thing. It's sort of like, it's cause you like them. Yeah. It's sort of like um, playing dress up or like when, when my son puts on superhero costumes, it's the same thing. You want to emulate that person. I think yeah. in the world of comedy um, for me, what I like trying to go after is finding the thing that finds that creates a character that's got some sort of, a goofy joy um, mm. that's fun to um, to just to get into. I mean, once we put Kamala's wig on me, we knew I looked like her, so there wasn't much right. I had to do there. But totally. um, you know, I was in, I was intimidated to play her specifically because I already admired her and um, didn't find her to be very funny. I found her to be really um, right gifted and intelligent and bright and um and totally. strong and uh didn't find a lot to be you know to to ape so to speak because there really wasn't much to make fun of but mm. i don't like making fun of things to begin with so yeah. um what i enjoyed about doing it was finding the thing about her that was the joyful place the fun um joyful. You know, and yeah. she's she's obviously enjoying her life as well yeah. and She's okay. got a big smile on her face um, a lot of the time. But also the thing that I tapped into right away with her, she's so damn cool that it's like, totally. it's so fun to play into that area of her. And mm. um, and actually my friend Steve Higgins, who I'm grateful to this day for, um, for my job at SNL, was the one who came up with Funt because he said, uh, my wife, <laughs> My wife always um, wants to be the fun aunt. She calls it the fun. And I, we both thought like, yeah, that's right. That's, that's, it. that's what you want. That's it. And, and I think just those things where you're looking for like, for me personally, knowing that I'm not like, when I was at the show, Daryl Hammond was the resident impressionist and he yeah. is such a genius. And I knew that that wasn't why I was at the show. Right. Um, I think you have to figure out what it is that you do and what you bring to things. And I think that there's a goofy element that I like to bring to things. Um, and he helped mm. me actually originally with Oprah for the show. Cause I didn't mm-hmm. know how to do her. And, um, it was written for mm. me and I thought like, I, I don't know what to, what to do, right. you know? And he really helped me look at her and find the things to play that, that made sense for, for, for my, right instrument i guess yeah you're like the vessel or the vessel i was the easy way of saying it but yeah i know i was gonna say vessel and i tried not to oh. say for saying it because i feel less gross about it <laughs> totally yeah th- it must be tricky sometimes with somebody like oprah when it's somebody so well known that you almost have to find 
your way into it. But I like this idea that it sounds like it's about finding the joy and not just in creating characters, just in your work. For me, yes. Um, I think it took me a long time to realize that that's what it was, yeah. but it is for sure. That's cool. I also just think I felt like if I, I remember Lorne expressing to us, if it's funny to you when you're writing it, it's funny. And I think that mm. that's a really important thing for me to constantly remember, especially yeah. when you're creating content. And um, if you're trying to fit into something and it's not, it doesn't feel good to you. It's probably not, yeah. you're not conveying it the way that you want to. And mm-hmm. I've, I've noticed that after I've written something that, is making me laugh. That can be more infectious. I mean, infectious. You know, yeah. It's just like it's just yeah. human nature stuff. I feel like it's you know we're yeah. all we're all humans, and when people smile, it's hard not to that you know it's that thing of, like, response. It's hard not yeah. to crack up. Yeah, totally. It's and you something you genuinely find that's like pure. That's pure gold. Totally. And in terms of creating characters, I have to ask about voiceover as well. You're. First of all, The Judge on The Good Place, it's another Emmy-nominated performance in the same category. It's my favorite part about The Good Place. But um, can I ask about Big Mouth? Because that is such a voice. I think of that as such a, like, that, correct me if I'm wrong, like, took a lot of work to construct and a lot of work to, like, get into a character. I don't even know. I don't remember. (laughs) You know, it's funny because that that character was not what I was hired to play on Big Math. I was hired to play Nick's mom, Diane, and Fred Armisen and I play his parents, Elliot and Diane. And Mm -hmm. I think it was like the second or third episode, I don't remember. And they said that Nick played a hormone monster and they needed me to play Jesse's female hormone monstrous. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny and... um, it's always really hard to come up with a new voice because you don't really know okay. if you're going to find something that works or if you like it or hmm. if they like it. And we that did try to figure it out together for a while there. And then hmm. we kind of found her game pretty quickly that she really eats up, you know, bees and bubbles, yes. you know, like that and the, the and, and syllables and, and right. that her tone of voice is a bit roller coastery, which is yes. fitting for her hormone roller coaster ride. Um, and, and then it just became this thing that like was making us all so happy. I didn't realize that I was creating a new character, but you know, Connie got a lot of love. And so they kept right. bringing her back. Um, yeah. It's the first, I think it's the first character I've ever created that people get a tattoo of now. I I've never. Oh my gosh. That before. Yes. <laughs> You see your animated character on people's bodies. Yeah. They're <laughs> poor parents. And I love this, what you said about it's, is it a game, especially is that voiceover? Is that acting in general? Like the, what is the game of the character? I guess. The game in terms of like what I'm, what I'm after. Or like you said, the game of her voice was the bees and the, and that's the end. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I think for her, it's, She's got a very melodic voice, for sure. Yeah. Um, I think the yeah. elements of her being a monster and her being hormonal. <laughs> um, I was trying to like to create this game of like um, highs and lows, as well as um, big. She's big and hairy. Cool. You know, she's yeah. a big hairy lady, and um, and also, you know very like sexual um, and unapologetically big and hairy. Mm. Um, You know, she likes the smell of her own stink kind of lady. So that requires a much bigger voice than my own. Um, Luckily I have a nice and low voice if I try to, to make a, make a voice. So I was really kind of trying to massage, massage that out of her. Um, She's like one of the most fun characters oh, yeah. I've ever gotten to do. And that really speaks a lot to the joy of, of um, doing voiceover is in animation is that you can really be anything. Um, mm. And mm. I love, I love that there's a place to perform where you are given that freedom, you know, and that, that room mm. to really, you know, go outside of your own physicality. Um, totally. To create yeah. something. Like voiceover is still a place where you can do that elevating to like, like Connie is a, what you were saying earlier about the, the female, female 
character yeah. who's bigger than she is oh, a yeah. diva. Yes. You could yeah. be, I can't remember her name, but there's a drag queen that does Connie. That's amazing. Oh, uh-huh. Amazing. Right. And then it started yeah. like people started remixing Connie saying bubble bath and um, yes, bubble bath. <laughs> um, yeah. It's pretty, it's, it's my dream. It's your dream. I love that you're a fan of drag. It really, it like something clicked. It's like, it makes sense. that It does make sense. Do right. It does. And it's sort of yeah. like, I think so many actors, you know, when you talk about it, really will all admit to this imposter syndrome that we all kind of feel like we don't oh, really wow. belong. Yeah. We don't know what we're doing. We don't fit in. We're not good enough and blah, 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 blah. And, um, I think that definitely is sort of like an Achilles heel for me is this sort of idea of femininity. And I think mm. one of this, one of the amazing things that I discovered about my own strength is that I'm whether mm. without being aware of it, I created something stronger out of what I think was probably um, what I thought, what I saw as a deficiency uh, oh. or you just felt really. And created something that's almost like a kind of like a superhero you know yeah and i love that and i love you know it speaks a lot to like our own personal um ability to survive and to protect ourselves um and totally yeah this life you know in a way where we can feel stronger yeah that's really beautiful it's 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 helpful to um to think of acting in that way as as Somewhere you, that you can explore your vulnerability and protect yourself. Yeah, yeah. I like to hide. <laughs> like to hide. That's wonderful, yeah. Hi, I'm Maya. I like to hide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gosh, this is so, you've, this is awesome. You've given such a wonderful, like, narrow, just window into your process right from the get-go. I can't thank you enough. Can oh. I, I have to let you go, but can I ask you some, like, backstagey, nerdy questions? Yeah. Um. Do you remember how you got your SAG card? Oh, I probably, well, I think, do you get them from commercials? I don't remember. I was in, a, I was in commercials first. I think so I maybe that, was, that was speak, after. Right? There's after. Because and... I was in a Budweiser commercial first. That was really exciting. Okay. Um, Is that like your first time on a set? Yeah. Other than music videos. Yeah. I used to do a lot of oh, music okay. videos and not a lot. What am I saying? I did some music videos. Let's be honest. But a Budweiser commercial. I love that. <laughs> Budweiser commercial was one of those things where it was like a bunch of kids hanging out, drinking Bud. Oh, no. You know, oh, okay. Like hipsters, when hipsters were becoming a thing. Sure, sure. Um, and then um, I think I think City of Angels was my first yeah. true job. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Just and they big. were nice enough to let me go and do Saturday Night Live. <laughs> oh, and wow. we Gabrielle Union came in after that. We, oh, cool. We did a, we, yeah, we did a... A do do Yeah. Okay, cute. Um, what is one performance that you think every actor should see and why? We we're not talking about myself, right? We're just talking about the world <laughs> of, of... No, but if you want to recommend one of your own, that's great too. Um, no, we're good. Um, <laughs> I've asked people for their... I've asked a lot of people who their favorite actor is, and a lot of people have said you. I remember no. Michael Kenneth Williams said, like, you're probably his favorite who, performer. Who? Who said that? Michael Kenneth Williams. <gasps> He did? Yeah, because he was like, she can do anything. And I was like, I know. <laughs> oh, my God. That's amazing. I can't believe anyway. you said that. Um, tell him tell him I love him. Wow. <laughs> I, um, next I think about. one of the coolest things I was lucky enough to see was um, the, ca- the original cast of Hamilton, specifically oh Leslie Odom Jr. I don't yes. think I've ever seen anything personally like that on stage yeah. like I think it's what I dreamt of when I was like a kid and like you got to see you know somebody amazing perform like a Ben Vereen or or yeah. somebody when you were like wow I wish I could go back in time and go to Broadway and see like ultimate performers but yeah. Leslie Odom Jr. was so incredible yeah and I couldn't stop talking about it. And I was, I was like, finally on the right side of history where I was like, I, I got to see it. I, I was so physically there. Yeah. Um, and then we just rewatched it again now yes. that it's on Disney. And my God, I was right. It was, you were right. It, I made my whole body feel crazy. And I have to say on top of that, the cooler, the even cooler part of that was, I could go on and on. Um, but, Me too, yes. 
I just loved that Lin Manuel Miranda. I loved knowing that he created that show and he yeah. was there on that stage because it wasn't just about watching him perform. It was about watching him perform all the people that he wanted to perform his work. Yeah. And I saw mm. this cohesive thing happening. Totally. That I love. Like I'm I'm really into comedy as a team sport. Yeah. I don't like single like hey guys look at me. I like I like when my te- I like when I have my team behind me. I like I like a gang. And yeah. that 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 show feels that way in the most exciting way and everyone that that that's in it shines and you can feel it and it's really palpable. Yeah. It's amazing. Cohesive is totally it's totally the word and that's you hit the nail on the head in terms of like you Watching that, I remember thinking, like, this is historic. This feels like I was there. I was in the room where it happens or whatever. You were and, like, literally in the room where it happened. Literally. And now it's kind of weird that it's available on Disney Plus so you can relive it and other people can see it. I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it, no. History um, being rolled out to the millions. Totally. And it's also funny that um, that the jokey word vessel that we were using earlier, I, yeah. I said that because that's what, he, that's what Leslie often says. It's like he's, really? that's sort of how he thinks of his performances. Yeah, it's like... He that is guy. a channel through which the art. I'll just, just saying his name gives me a little goosey bumpies. <laughs> you really speak in my language because he's, I really do think of him as one of, the, it's one of the greatest musical theater performances of all time. It's so. unbelievable. Um, okay, thank you. Last question. Uh, if you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would that be? Mm, don't wax your eyebrows. <laughs> okay really really stupid just like don't mess with them or yeah don't fuck with them the 90s was really cruel that whole courtney love pixie thin eyebrow thing was a really stupid idea (laughs) and luckily most of mine grew back but man they were they were fantastic (laughs) and also just just every time i was in a bikini i should have taken a picture oh taken more pictures yeah 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 yeah, that bod, that bod was smoking. Okay. That's, That's pre- really good advice. That pre four kids bod was really smoking. Four kids. <laughs> amazing. Oh, amazing. Maya, thank you so much. This is just, this is such a pleasure. Oh, thank you, Jack. You have my heart because my son's name is Jack. So. Oh, but I didn't know that. Oh, amazing. We yeah. just spoke with Nancy Cartwright, who also has a son named Jack. That's what's, Really? Yeah. I love Nancy Cartwright. Yeah. Well, we obviously are smart women, so. Yes. Amazing. Ah, thank you so much. And thank um, you. It was a pleasure. Congrats on your nominations. And Thanks. Good luck. Thank you so much, Jack. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grouse Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks, as always, to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and, of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.